Would you please stand for the reading of the gospel? This is from Luke chapter 4, 16 through 19. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. You may be seated. What have you wanted more than anything else at Christmas time? Is there something that uh, you circled in your Sears and Roebuck catalog, or maybe now you put on your Amazon.com wish list, something that you just really wanted? There was a gift that I wanted Santa to bring me every single year. I would crawl up into his lap at Northside Mall in Dothan, Alabama, and every year I'd ask for the same thing. And then on Christmas Eve, I would go and look out my window with my little innocent eyes and I'd stare up at the stars and I'd beg Santa's elves to make me this gift that I wanted. It was like my obsession just couldn't end. Like the the Red Rider, you know, BB gun that would shoot your eye out. But mine was something different. In fact, one year at my birthday, which is in April, I'd had a pretty good year and I had collected some, you know, nice amount of birthday money and mom was coming to tuck me in and there I was counting my money and she said, what'd you get? And I said, $105. And she said, wow, what are you going to do with all that money? And I said, well, I'm going to spend five of it, but I'm saving $100 because I'm afraid Santa is not going to bring me this year the gift that I really want. And she said, what are you talking about, son? And I said, I'm going to use my $100 and on the day after Christmas, if he hasn't brought me a swimming pool, I'm going to put one in the backyard. (laughs) That would have been my Christmas miracle. I mean, I'm telling you, I wanted that swimming pool. I didn't understand. I was like Clark Griswold, but a little kid. I just saw myself swimming in that swimming pool. And every year I'd run past the Christmas tree and look out the back window and be instantly devastated. How could cry, I mean, Santa not bring me that, that? You see what's happening? It's the point of the sermon. How could I not get that swimming pool for Christmas? And and, and then I would get a Game Boy or something nice, you know, a a toy truck that I really wanted, something that would distract me, and I would end up having a happy Christmas, but but I, I just wanted that one gift that would have been really my Christmas miracle. Finally, my parents moved into a home with a swimming pool. I was a freshman in college. That's a true story. I never got to enjoy the swimming pool, really. And, and, and I think about all the things that we hope for and wish for at Christmas time. I mean, surely there's something that uh, you're, you know, hoping that, that you might get. Or if you're a young person, you probably have this. Uh, it starts simple, you know, a slingshot or a doll or something like that. And then as we get a little bit older, play school's no longer good enough. And we have to have, you know, the sleek, slim new PlayStation 48 or whatever it is this year that's the hot new toy. And, and, and as we get even older, our desires become even more sophisticated. And, and we start to have these ideas because we're seduced like everyone else by the sirens of materialism and consumerism that teach us that a new gadget or a new toy or a new gift is really going to bring us some sense of fulfillment or merriment. But it doesn't. It never does. We're always left still with a desire for something to bring us joy that's much more than uh, an expression of self-indulgence and wealth. What's happening at Christmas time? is we're starting to teach our children that really it is all about materialism and frenzy and self-indulgence and wealth. (coughs) And we are forgetting that there is truly a Christ to be celebrated on December 25th. I mean, it's amazing. If you think about it, how the world celebrates Jesus Christ's birthday. I mean, because that's really what it is. It's not supposed to be a second birthday for us, only a lot better and a lot bigger, because at least Christmas was always better and bigger than my birthday. It's supposed to be about a celebration of who Jesus is, of, of, of Christ and his birth into this world. 
But if you think about the way that we focus our minds and our hearts around this time of year, you, you start to think about all the stress and the preparation of getting ready for the next party or the next food or the next gift that has to be bought. And we do somehow miss out on really the, the reason for why we even have this season of year. It can get lost in the chaos. But here is what Isaiah prophesied and what Jesus preached he was to be in this world. God sent a son, we just read it, to bring good news to the poor. Jesus said, he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Did you hear those words? God sent his son to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to let the oppressed go free. If your Christmas celebration doesn't look like that, then it's been hijacked and exploited. That's, that's it. Because this, this is the gospel. This is who Christ has come to be. And I'm not trying to be a party pooper. I, I like having a holly jolly Christmas just like the rest of us. But I am a minister of the gospel. And we are, as a church, supposed to reclaim the season of Advent and Christmas from all those that are trying to edge out the real miracle worker at Christmas time. That's our responsibility as the body of Christ in this world. I mean, what if Jesus showed up this year and looked around, maybe not in your homes, but just looked around in our society and looked at how we celebrated his birthday? Does it look at all like the gospel? Does this celebration of self-indulgence and abundance and extravagance look like the one who came for the least, the last, and the lost? The poor and the oppressed and the marginalized. To set at liberty those who were oppressed. We have to reclaim the real joy of the season. It can't be found in a gadget can't be found in a toy or in gift giving really at all. It can only be found in living and giving like Christ. That's where we will come to know real joy. Isaiah wanted us to make sure we understood who this Messiah was that was coming. He's an Old Testament prophet. It's a big book. There's a lot of things in there. But one of the things he concentrates on is telling us about the advent or the coming of the Messiah. And he explains who this Messiah is going to be. He talks about him as Emmanuel, God with us. That's the focus of next week's sermon. He, he, he calls him in chapter 9, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. In 54, we learn that the Messiah king will be suffering and will be rejected. And in chapter 61 of Isaiah, we learn that his mission will be for the poor. And the marginalized. Isaiah the prophet wanted us to have a picture of the Messiah before Christ really came into our lives. So we'd be prepared for what he would look like. I mean, when you think about it, when you close your eyes, what does God look like to you? I mean, really. What, what does God look like to you? When I was a kid, I knew exactly what God looked like. I could tell you, I could describe it, I could draw it. I'm not a very good drawer, but I got close. God, to me, was a picture that I saw in the stained glass window at Covenant United Methodist Church because I went there every single Sunday for the first 18 years of my life, and I saw this image, and I knew that was God. He had blonde hair and white skin and blue eyes and red and white robes. His arms were reached out like this, and he had little lambs at his feet. He was in a beautiful garden, and there was a stream going right through it. And every time I closed my eyes, every time I prayed, that is who I saw in my mind. I knew that was who God was. And, and that image is still there in my mind a little bit when I think about God. The, the Israelites, they knew who God was. He was going to be this political revolutionary who would come to claim victor for the Jewish nation. And when we think about God, we oftentimes think about adjectives like power and almighty. But you know, when God came in the form of Jesus, he didn't look like strength. He looked like weakness. He really turned all of the world's expectations upside down. He looked like the Messiah that Isaiah proclaimed he would be. 
prophesied he would be, but not the Messiah that we pictured in our hearts. He came to a Palestinian Jewish family that was totally marginalized. He came to this poor family who spent the first few years of Jesus' life as refugees in Africa, according to the gospel, because of political genocide. And then he was moved to this nondescript town and raised in a low-income, hard-working family with no power, no prestige, no recognition. That's who Jesus was. Now some of us think that Jesus is this wonderful God who is going to bless those who are obedient to him with wealth and physical health. But if you look at the holiest family that has ever lived in this world, you'll know that's hogwash. That's prosperity gospel, but it ain't the gospel. Jesus doesn't hand out money to those who are nice to him or obedient to him. That's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some people today think that Jesus came to favor some over others. That's not there either. Some people think that Jesus came into the world just so that we might have heaven one day when we die. And he's not about restoring life in the here and now. That's not there either. Who is it that you picture when you picture Jesus Christ as a man, he lived in tension with all the religious authorities. He came not to condemn, but defend the sinner. He came for the widow and the orphan and the poor. He came into this world and he bucked all the obsession that humanity had with wealth, with power, with recognition. He said no to all of that. He came, as we just read, to be the embodiment of God's values and God's priorities. To bring good news to the poor. To proclaim release to the captives. To bring recovery of sight to the blind. To let the oppressed go free. And to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. God looks like Jesus. And Jesus is right here in the gospel. The one with the least, the last, and the lost. When he went to Nazareth's synagogue to read this passage of scripture, they not only rejected him by kicking him out of the synagogue, they took him up on top of a cliff and tried to kill him because they really didn't want to hear that this was who the Messiah was. They had an image of God in their minds and it didn't look like that at all. Jesus was totally rejected in his hometown proclaiming that this is who God is. Today in our hometown, we sometimes, I think, think of God like a Santa Claus. Maybe he's not shimmying down a chimney and handing out toys, but maybe more like a genie in a bottle to grant us three wishes whenever we ask, or somehow this golden calf Messiah that's going to offer us an abundance or an extravagance or comfort or leisure or things that we think we might deserve if we're just good enough. And, you know, we even use this kind of behavior modification at Christmas time. We do it in my house. My mom did it to me. I now do it to Joseph. December 25th is coming. Santa's coming. If you're good enough, if you're not naughty, if you're nice. And we sometimes think that way about God and about Jesus. But that's not who it is. And there's nothing wrong with us giving gifts out at Christmas time. God knows your pastor is going to be giving gifts to people at Christmas time. We have the three gifts rule at our house. Each person gets three gifts like the three wise men, even though that's kind of baloney too, because there were a lot more than three wise men. Sorry to ruin your nativities, but there were. (laughs) But we just have some limits, and that's the one that we pick is, is three, and, and we try to... But you see, the, the point of Christmas time isn't really about that exercise of giving people to have no real need for things anyway. The, the, the point is that our heart, our minds, our spirits are not focused on materialism or consumerism or some kind of festivity that celebrates self instead of Christ but that our minds and our hearts and our spirits might find refocus on Jesus Christ. Will you have a tradition in your house that really focuses on Christ and the joy that he's come to bring this Christmas time? Because Christmas really is about a miracle. 
It's about a miracle of God being done in this world. I think one of the miracles that we all need, that can set us free even, is for us to actually focus on Christ, on the real miracle worker whose society is trying to take away from this time of year. To live more like the image of Christ that we see in the scripture. We have the power because we have the spirit in us to change traditions. To transform the whole world. But if we don't even think that we can transform the world, we know we can transform our households. So how will Christmas be celebrated in your family this year? That really looks like Christ's birthday. And, and that looks like a Christ who's come to set the oppressed free, to proclaim good news to the poor. Isaiah knew that it was important how we imaged God, how we thought of who the Messiah was. He went on to say that God incarnate who came to set us free would be despised and rejected by men. He would be a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering, like one from whom people hide their faces. He would not be esteemed but he would be despised. And Jesus himself said that when you feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the sick or the imprisoned, you will see me. You will be loving me. Are we going to be like those people in Nazareth and reject Christ this Christmas? Take him out of our homes? Or will we be the people who like Christ Extend love to the least, the last, the lost. We really can, by Christ, make a tradition for ourselves, for our families, where we proclaim good news to the poor, release to the captive, recovery of sight to the blind. That can be part of your Christmas tradition. Because grace is free, but it isn't cheap. It always comes at a cost. Mary and Joseph, ostracized, rejected. John the Baptist, assassinated. Jesus lived every day of his life, sacrificing. And I know, an Advent sermon, as we're getting close to December 25th, shouldn't be about sacrifice. Save that for the cross, Pastor. But honestly, as Paul will tell us in Philippians 3, as Christians, we cannot ever be separated from the sufferings of Christ. You can't take the cradle and not also think of the cross. Because that is the life of joy found in Christ, is giving of ourselves to others. We can't find meaning and purpose in focusing on self and self-indulgence. We can't find meaning and purpose in escalating debt, which, by the way, in American households, the most escalation in debt is found in December, right before Christmas. And, and psychologists say that we have seasonal depressive disorder, especially this is prevalent among, amongst women who are getting all stressed and frenzied over people coming and things that must be done and the pressure. That's not Jesus' birthday, friends. That's not what Christ looks like in the gospel. God has told us to get a life by giving away our life, to find joy by living as He has lived in this world. That's the miracle of Christmas. When we learn to live and give like Christ, when we remember who God really sent into this world. I want to share with you a Christmas miracle that you all were a part of. You may not know a lot about this, but um, our church put together some of our tithes and offerings this year. And uh, we bought boxes of food for the Treasure Hill community. And the youth put all the food together and we had a nice ham and a lot of goods that went to these people's houses. Uh, so that anyone who might have need would, would be able to have a feast. Uh, at least one nice meal at Thanksgiving time. We wanted to do this as a symbol of our Thanksgiving for our neighbors and our Thanksgiving for God. So we sent a nice letter, a nice box of food. But of course, our giving isn't limited just by geography. So occasionally persons or families would come and need some extra assistance. And so we would offer these boxes as people had need. It was a little bit harder to track some of the folks that we were giving these boxes to, but we gave them out anyway. One family that was in that category sent a letter of thanks. And we don't often get that. Oftentimes people will come by and thank us and hug us and tell us their story or 
But, but this, this family sent a letter, and so I wanted to share it with you, but still keep anonymity. She writes, to the members of Perdido Bay United Methodist Church, my family and I would like to say thank you for the food given to us to enjoy a Thanksgiving meal together. It was greatly appreciated. This is just a little note to let you know about our situation. I'm 59 years old and the only person who works full-time at the galley on base. My grandson, and then she names him, witnessed a severe beating of his mother two years ago and ran and hid with his infant brother while his mother was beaten unconscious. Please excuse some of my spelling because of the arthritis in my hands. My grandson has post-traumatic stress disorder. He's now 10 after witnessing this event. He ran in fear of his and his baby brother, who was only three months old when this happened, an eight-year-old running away with a three-month-old baby in fear of their lives. As a result of this, his grades have dropped and also his attitude has changed. Please continue to pray for him and for our family as we try to get him help. My husband is now totally dependent on kidney dialysis and is disabled. He gets a small social security check each month, but everything goes to pay our bills and there's no extra to get the kind of things his schoolmates may wear or take part in, the extracurricular activities such as basketball or soccer. We went to the local park, but they don't have a sliding scale to pay for such things. My grandson has lived with us for the last two years and... My husband and I try to do the best we can for him and his little brother. I depend on his mother to take care of the two-year-old and to drive her father to and from dialysis three days a week while I'm working the split shifts at the galley. I'm at work a total of 12 hours a day but get paid for eight-hour shift because I have to stay on base in between my shifts to save money on my weekly gas allowance. There's more to tell about this story, but I'll finish now with a great big thank you for all your prayers and the wonderful gift. Thank you for seeing the need that my grandsons have. And then she signed their names. She didn't leave a phone number or an address. There was a return address on the envelope that she sent, but it isn't their place where they live anymore. So we didn't have a way to reach out to them and to follow up. But this little miracle continues because last week I went up to the local school to eat with a kid who I've been uh, meeting with each week, and he was on a field trip. I didn't know he was going to be there, and so I looked down at the little Happy Meal that I had brought him, and I was pretty excited. Double cheeseburger and fries all for me. That's not my usual lunch. And uh, I was walking out uh, of the lunchroom, and a teacher stopped me and said, David, uh, I know that you're here for Jerry, and he's not here this week. Uh, Could you come sit down with this little kid over here who needs some extra attention? I said, sure. I love to sit and talk and eat. Five minutes into the conversation, I realized he was the boy in this letter. That's God, friends, putting us all together. Earlier that morning, a woman in our church came up to the office and said that uh, we'd given out all the angel tree names. That's like 100 kids out there. And and she and her family have kids in college, and they, they really just want to do something for someone else this year for Christmas, spend their Christmas budget on a family in need. And we didn't know uh, necessarily because we'd already helped so many families who we were going to give. But I said, well, we'll take down your information. Someone will come along. That had happened that morning. So I got back to church and I connected Vivian, our community missionary, with the young kid and his family. With this family in our church. And now they're going to have a Christmas meal and gifts, tree, things that show these two little boys that they're loved, cared for. And now the teachers know, the grandparents know, and the community knows a little bit more about the love of Christ that's born at Christmas. But more than all of that, we together have offered another gift to Christ because that's how we celebrate His birthday. God knows that miracles don't just appear like magic or out of thin air. Miracles happen in your heart, your heart. He doesn't care about the extraordinary and the expensive. He cares about the ordinary, about you and me. And he puts within us a spark, and then it is developed and clarified with conviction. And when we act on that, when we are sent out by God to offer Christ's love to someone else, that's when miracles take place. Those are the people God uses, the Advent story, in the whole of Scripture, you and me. 
to be his miracle? What's yours going to be this year? Are you going to decide, you know, for all the money we spend on our own children, we're going to offer that also to foster kids through the United Methodist Children's Home and our white Christmas offering will take up December 24th so that kids who've been forgotten or abused or left will have something this year. Or maybe you'll give a life-giving donation to UMCOR and Disaster Relief to help out a family that's been left in devastation. Or maybe you'll visit someone who's sick or an elderly person you know that's part of the brokenness of this world that Christ has come to heal. Maybe you'll decide, you know, instead of another candle or a pretty ornament, I'll make a gift to the next Stop Hunger Now event or the next mobile food pantry and feed someone in the name of my loved one this year at Christmas. Maybe you'll pull a redemption store shift or your family will go and shop for an angel or you'll meet with the grumpies to continue to help bring Christ further into this world. There's so many ways that God may be sending you. What I know is that he is. That is how we really find joy at Christmas. Christ came into this world to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captive, set at liberty all those who are oppressed. So it should be no surprise to us that when we live and give like Christ, that's where we'll find life, meaning, and purpose. The real holly jolly of Christmas. So where is the Christ of Christmas, the Christ who's come to set us free, sending you? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.